Good evening. My name is Christina Forbes. I am with the Frederick County Elder Services Provider Council. And on behalf of the council and our committee, we're so happy to have you with us tonight. Uh, I'm excited. We've got some newcomers to the webinar. We've got some other names that I recognize that have been here before. Uh, we're thrilled that all of you have made the time to join us tonight. Uh, the Elder Services Provider Council is a networking group of senior care professionals here in Frederick County committed to supporting one another, but more importantly, committed to supporting seniors and their caregivers. Uh, so this webinar series uh, came out of COVID and we hope certainly uh, to keep it going because uh, we're excited by the response and uh, have gotten some great feedback about the topics that we've been sharing. Uh, quick note that starting next month, we've, we're moving the time until 7 p.m. and I'll share a little more information about that at the end. For those of you that are new to this Zoom format, I just want to uh, share with you that we can't see you or hear you, so please feel free to get comfortable. Uh, if you hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen, you should see uh, some icons come alive. Uh, please take note of the chat and the Q&A icons. Please use those. Uh, if you click on there, you can type questions to us. Please uh, feel free to type those questions throughout the presentation. I have some colleagues who are behind the screen keeping an eye on that. If it's something they can answer, if it's not related to our presentation, they will. Uh, otherwise, we will save them and give them to our presenters at the end of the presentation. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, we'll do our best to help navigate those as well. So again, use that uh, typing the, in the chat or the Q&A. Um, before we get started, I want to take a minute to thank our sponsor, Right at Home uh, Home Care Services. Uh, they have been a part of the Frederick County community for a very long time. Uh, they've certainly uh, very involved in our senior care community. So uh, we will take a quick minute to listen to a video. Uh, hang in with me while we get that started uh, so you can learn a little bit more about Right at Home Home Care. Right at Home is a leading national in-home care company that fosters a culture of teamwork, trust, and support. Right at Home was established over 25 years ago, and we've made it our mission to help our clients and family members navigate the aging journey from the comfort of their own home, wherever that may be. Right at Home offers custom care plans tailored to the needs of your loved ones and suitable for practically any living situation. Our caregivers are highly trained in their respective roles, but it's their compassion and commitment to their clients that sets Right at Home apart. We consider it a privilege to serve you and your loved ones, and we take that service wholeheartedly. Right at Home is proud to have received the Caring Stars recognition as one of the nation's top-rated home care agencies. Whether a family member needs help around the house, assistance recovering from a hospital stay, or someone to check on them throughout the week, Right at Home of Frederick County is the answer. Keeping you or your loved ones safe at home. After all, home is the best place to be. Right at Home. To schedule a complimentary consultation today, call us at 301-696-1122. The right care, right at home. Sorry about that. Uh, we'll share Right at Home's contact information with you at the end of our presentation. Uh, so let's get started. Navigating emergencies, something none of us ever hope will happen, but inevitably for some of us, it will. I am very excited tonight to present uh, two folks to you. Christy Dutrow is the Assistant Director of Emergency Communications at the Frederick County Division of Emergency Management. And Matthew Bergen is a certified community paramedic. He's with the Mobile Community Healthcare Program through the Frederick County Division of Fire and Rescue. So give us one second and we'll bring Matt and Christy up on the screen. Hello. Take it away, Matt. All righty, thank you so much. Uh, Christina, for the introduction, we're going to jump right into the uh, into the slideshow here, so uh, people get a chance to learn all about uh, hopefully something they never have to experience firsthand. Mm -hmm. 
Good evening, and thank you for having us. I'm Christy Dutro, the Assistant Director of Frederick County Emergency Communications. I have been with the Emergency Communications Center for 23 years, and I started out on the floor as a uh, call taker, a dispatcher, uh, emergency communications manager, where I managed a shift. I then moved into quality assurance training. Uh, I made the Freedom of Informat Information Act request, and now I'm the assistant director. And uh, Matthew Bergen, uh, currently serving as the division's community paramedic. I've uh, been with Frederick County Fire Rescue since 2013, and I had the opportunity to start in this role uh, about two years ago working with folks um, kind of before the emergency and, and trying to uh, keep uh, you know, all of our residents safe at home and, and hopefully not have to uh, reach out to our, our friends and colleagues uh, on the ambulance and, and in the fire stations. So uh, tonight, uh, we're happy to share with, with you all uh, some things to expect if, if you're ever in a position where you have to call 911 uh, what you should be prepared to expect when you're on the phone and then, uh, you know, in preparation for those responders to arrive at your location. Uh, we're going to start with a quick video that Christy worked to put together uh, that talks a little bit about 911 and, and, you know, again, a quick overview of what happens when you place that call. Hi, I'm Tracy and this is Catherine. We are Frederick County 911 dispatchers and we're here to tell you what to expect when dialing 911. We're on the line to listen and we also have important instructions to give you. Your 911 operator needs to get essential information from you as quickly as possible by asking the following questions in this order. What is the address of the emergency so we can send the right help to the right location? What is the phone number you're calling from? If the line disconnects, we may need to call you back. What is your name so we can address you properly? And tell me exactly what happened. Asking these questions allows operators to start dispatch to emergencies quickly. Your 911 operator is often working closely with one or more dispatchers, obtaining important information which is relayed to responders who are on the way to your location while you are still on the phone. This process is repeated on each call to ensure responders get to each emergency as quickly and safely as possible with the right information to provide the best service they can. Law enforcement, fire and rescue, and other responders rely on 911 operators and dispatchers to obtain specific information that varies with each type of call. Sometimes it may seem as though your 911 operator is asking a series of unnecessary questions, but in fact this information is vital for getting the right help sent to the right place. Often, help is already on the way while your 911 operator is talking to you. While emergency crews are responding, dispatchers continue to provide them with updated information gathered by your 911 operator. Also, your 911 operator may be able to provide you with important life-saving direction, from how to safely exit a building on fire to CPR instruction, providing important information for staying safe and out of danger during a vehicle accident, as well as helping a caller deliver a baby. For more information, visit frederickcountymd.gov slash 911 or call the non-emergency number at 301-600-1603. Okay, now I'm going to talk about placing the 911 call. When you call 911, the operator will ask each time, 911, Frederick County 911, what is the address of the emergency? So we wanna to try to get as much information as possible. If you're calling from a home address, provide the, the number of the house, provide the name, the street name. If you have cross streets, that's helpful as well. But we always want to get the address and we verify the address just to make sure that we have the correct numbers and the street name. Uh, not only when we ask for the address, we also, if you're not at an address, we could also ask if it's a common place. For instance, if it's a McDonald's, uh, you could tell us 
that you're at a certain location, a common place, which would be McDonald's or a shopping mall, or just, um, you know, an area where it's common to us that we would be able to find you. We also um, ask if you're at an intersection on a highway, that's helpful as well. So when you're driving down the road, it's important to know your surroundings, the mile markers, the cross streets, the intersections, any landmarks that might be helpful for us to locate you. And again, we do verify that information. Another thing we always ask, the second most important thing is the phone number. Number. We want to be able to contact you in case if we would get disconnected. So we ask you your phone number and then we also will then say what um, if you can verify that phone number. We then ask you what the problem is. We want a description of the problem. If you tell us that someone is having chest pain, well, what, what may have caused the chest pain? Well, my husband was out shoveling snow. So that gives us an idea, more information to be able to provide to the um, paramedics responding to your location. We want to know, are you with the patient so that we can get additional information? If it's a vehicle accident or if it's um, an incident where there may be numerous people hurt, well, we want to find out how many people are hurt, how many people are sick so that we can get the right resources to you. We always want to know the, pa the age of the patient. It's very important. It also will help the providers prepare on their way to the location to know what, what age of the patient is. Male or female, that could also um, determine what type of care is being provided. We wanna know, are they awake? Are they breathing? These are, information, these are questions that are um, necessary for the response to you, but also are we going to need to provide pre-arrival instructions as well? Each caller is treated the same, they're our customer. We treat all customers the same by using these protocols. I, I have an example here for a chest pain call. We go through key questions so that we can get additional information. Has, he, has she ever had a heart attack or angina? We wanna be able to ask these questions. Is she completely alert? Is she breathing normally? Is she changing color? Is she clammy? We wanna, we want to know this information so, again, we can provide the right pre-arrival instructions and provide you the right care. Each caller, again, we want to be able to remind them and reassure the caller that we're sending the paramedics to help them now. Stay on the line, I'll tell you exactly what to do next. Sometimes patients or callers will call us and they'll say, do we need to give them a medication? We will always tell them, remind her to do what her doctor has instructed her to do for these, instruct, for these situations. So we wanna make sure that um, if the doctor has provided you those information or those instructions, we want you to be able to follow those. We won't give you instructions for your medications. However, for some chest pain calls, we may advise you to uh, take aspirin or have the patient take aspirin we, again, those key questions are very important because that will help us guide you to those pre-arrival instructions. We're going to reassure you that help is on the way. Um, not to have anything to eat or drink. It might make you sick or cause problems for the doctor. And we want you to rest in the most comfortable position. We'll also tell you to turn lights on, unlock the doors, or have someone unlock the doors. Um, and get the medications together. These are some of the things that we will help provide to the caller so that they're prepared for the paramedics to arrive. When we have a person that's in cardiac arrest or is unconscious and we wanna keep an airway open, we have these pre-arrival instructions and we go step by step and I'm just showing one of them. We'll tell you, lay them down carefully. We will walk you through CPR. We walk people through childbirth. We also uh, walk people through administering epinephrine. These are just some of the things that we do to help callers before the paramedics arrive. Thanks for sharing that, Christy. That's, uh, I, I imagine for a lot of folks, it's probably a pretty eye-opening 
uh, thing to get to see the behind the scenes, you know, it, you know, calling 911 can be a, a, a stressful event, uh, you know, in and of itself, not to mention the, you know, the event that occurred that precipitated the need to call 911. So, you know, hopefully having a chance to see that uh, kind of what goes on behind the scenes will, will maybe give folks a little bit of peace of mind. And, uh, and certainly, you know, a lot of the stuff that, that your caller, uh, call takers are, are providing the information, uh, like you said, it is important. Um, it, it helps us kind of get in the right mindset for what we're responding on. Certainly the way that we would respond to somebody with a heart attack is going to be a little bit different than the way we would respond to somebody maybe in a vehicle accident. And certainly that's going to be, you know, drastically uh, different from, you know, a house fire. So, you know, all of the information that, that folks are able to provide when they call, it is indeed very helpful. Um, what I want to touch on now is uh, some of the things that folks can do uh, ahead of the emergency, even before you ever have to dial 911, that will be helpful for us, uh, you know, if that should ever come to pass. So a big thing that we encounter a lot of times in the field are uh, houses that aren't very well marked or, or maybe a little bit difficult to see. Um, when it comes to address markings, uh, you know, there are uh, a lot of ways that folks have, have come up with to mark where they live. Um, we see on mailboxes uh, all the time, uh, these uh, the, on the screen where you guys can see the green placards with the reflective numbers, uh, those are are probably the easiest way that we can identify uh, a house from the street. But certainly if, if the numbers are on a mailbox, we would encourage folks to make sure that they're either located on the front of the mailbox or on both sides, uh, you know, depending on, on the route of travel that the ambulance may be taking. Um, we also like to see the numbers on the house. Uh, the larger the numbers and the more higher contrast, the, the easier they're gonna be to see from a distance. Uh, and then, you know, especially Frederick County is, is kind of unique in the sense that we have uh, urban areas, we have suburban areas, and, and we have some pretty rural areas too. Uh, and in those rural areas, shared driveways present a little bit of a challenge also, um, you know, especially when you get houses that have, uh, you know, a couple of different uh, residences behind, uh, you know, maybe a good ways off the street even and they all use a common driveway where those driveways start to split off, it, it really does help to have those um, marked at, at each uh, you know, split. So all, all of that helps. And, and Christy, you had touched on uh, reminding callers to turn on their front porch light. Uh, you know, that is a big help for us, making sure that the, the porch light is uh, you know, in good working order can help us uh, you know, find it even in the daytime, if, if we see a, a house with a light on, uh, you know, that's helps us to understand that we might be close to where we need to be. Um, so those are certainly some things that, that folks can do ahead of the emergency, but there's e even more that we'd like to encourage folks to do. And that uh, includes the items you see up on your screen here. So Working from uh, left to right, uh, you know, the first thing you guys see is a big red folder with a, a large white star of life uh, emblazoned on the front. Uh, this is uh, a item that's available through Frederick Health Hospital. Uh, it, it is intended to go on the refrigerator and so it actually has two large magnets on the back and it's made out of a vinyl material that's uh, pretty durable and, and can hold a lot of documents. And this is something that our responders have been trained to look for uh, when we arrive at the home. Uh, it's especially helpful if uh, somebody's having difficulty communicating uh, or if a, uh, a caregiver is uh, away and, and maybe somebody's filling in that may not be very familiar with the patient. Uh, having this red folder is a huge help, um, especially when it's got the, the, the correct documents in it. And that's the other two items you see on the screen are examples of some of the things that help us um, 
to better understand the patient as a person. So uh, it, in the middle, you see a medical information card. That's something that we're able to distribute, but a lot of folks will get something very similar to this from their doctor. They may have some discharge instructions that have this information on it. But the, the key information that we're looking for uh, is pretty basic stuff. Name, address, birthday, medications, uh, allergies, and medical conditions. Those are, are gonna be some of the, the most important things that we as responders are going to need to have a good understanding of in order to be able to treat the patient accordingly. Another document that uh, seems to be coming uh, a little bit more familiar to folks, but we still get questions on pretty regularly, uh, and this is all the way on the right-hand side, the uh, Maryland Medical Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment is a, uh, it's a medical order that directs the, the care that the patient wishes to receive, uh, very similar in function to an advanced directive, but the, uh, the Maryland Medical Order for Life Sustaining Treatment is actually signed by a physician, and that's what uh, we are required to adhere to. Unfortunately, the advanced directive, uh, we're not able to, to follow that specifically. We, we like to see the most form completed and signed because that helps us to make sure that we're adhering to the patient wishes. And uh, having all of these documents centrally located inside of this red folder, uh, you know, it's a big help. It helps cut down a lot of the confusion and the chaos uh, that may be surrounding the emergency. And again, having that in a place that's easy to identify, like the front of a refrigerator, uh, certainly does help our responders. Any other documents that may be important should also go in that folder. So if, if there are advanced directives, they should go in there as well. Uh, any other pertinent medical information. Um, we do encourage folks to put copies of these documents in there. We never wanna see originals leave the home uh, just in case they do get lost in transit. Uh, we never wanna see an original document get lost or destroyed. Uh, we will take the folder with us to the hospital, uh, and then the hospital will ensure that that folder stays with the patient and goes uh, with the patient as they move through their hospital course. Uh, the folders uh, are available through Daybreak. Uh, Christina has uh, a supply that, that she has access to and can share. Uh, we also, through our community health program and fire rescue, are able to um, bring those folders out to the home, help get them set up and answer any questions that, uh, that folks may have as far as what to put in there or how to get a most form. And um, we're certainly happy to provide the contact information. I think here at the end, we're gonna share that. So uh, another question that we get a lot of times uh, is, wow, there's so many of you. And, and so I wanted to take a few minutes to just kind of touch on when you can expect to see two or three of us and when you may see a couple of more. And, and Christy kind of made light uh, to this when she was uh, discussing the cardiac arrest call. Uh, the, the higher the acuity of the call, typically the more folks you're going to see. So uh, for that cardiac arrest example, what you're likely to see is the, uh, the ambulance there in the middle of your screen is going to have two EMTs on it. Uh, you'll see a paramedic come in a chase car kind of in the bottom corner there. And then you'll see some additional EMTs and firefighters uh, arrive on a fire engine. And again, uh, that's to make sure that we have enough help uh, to, to take care of the patient in a, in a safe and effective way. Um, lower acuity, uh, relatively more simple calls uh, may only require an ambulance with two EMTs. Uh, and then the, the chest pain example that Krista used, uh, you would see the ambulance with the two EMTs and then a paramedic. So, uh, you know, that can be a, a bit cumbersome for some folks, uh, you know, that may not be prepared to, to expect to see that many people come. But again, we, we do wanna make sure that we have uh, enough responders coming to, to be able to safely help somebody. One of the, uh, the last challenges that I wanted to share with folks is something that we encounter, um, not typically to the degree that you see on your screen, but I did wanna share this 
uh, the, the easier it is for us to get into a home, the, the quicker we're going to be able to start providing care. Obviously, in this example, as you can see, uh, it, it would be very challenging for responders to get inside and, and start rendering aid. And uh, so having clear, unobstructed uh, access into the home um, will help to make sure that, that we can get the assistance in uh, as quickly as we can. Um, locked doors are something that are also a challenge. We, uh, contrary to what Hollywood has uh, told us, we actually don't like knocking down doors. Uh, that is going to be the very last resort for, uh, for our folks in the field. Uh, we do like to find less intrusive ways to get in, and, and a lot of folks have realized that and have started to install lockboxes. Uh, uh, one of the things that Christy uh, and her staff are able to do is actually take that information. If, if you have a lockbox that has a combination, uh, we can put that information into our computer system. It, it's uh, uh, an encrypted system, so it, it wouldn't be publicly available. That information would be shared directly from the 911 call center to the responding units, uh, and that would give us information on how to you know, use that lockbox and get in without having to do any damage or destruction. So uh, again, the, the number for the Diamond on one center, we'll, we'll circle back to that so everybody has it, but that would be the number you would call to add that information in, right, Christy? Yes. Um, so uh, those are, are some very high level uh, kind of tips and, and secrets from uh, the 911 and, and fire rescue world. So we'd like to, to go ahead and take an opportunity to open up the floor to any questions that, uh, that some of the viewers may have. Matt and Christy, that was fantastic. If you wanna take down your screen so folks can see you guys still, we have lots of questions. We will do that. All right. So Matt, I wanna ask about the lockbox. That sounds like a really smart idea, especially for someone who lives alone. Where would somebody find, where, where do you buy that? That's a, that's a really good question. So there, there's a couple of options. Um, Probably the one that's become most common here lately is, is Amazon. Uh, just a quick search for residential lockbox will, uh, I, I'm sure, yield lots of results. Local hardware stores are, are also carrying devices. Um, they don't need to be super fancy, just something uh, you know, very simple with a, either a, a dial or a, a touch combination uh, is helpful. Uh, also, 21st century, there's a lot of folks that we're starting to see have digital locks and, and are able to actually re remotely unlock doors. Those tend to be a little bit cost prohibitive, uh, whereas your, your conventional residential lockbox should run somewhere in the neighborhood of about $20 to $30. Excellent. Great idea. Someone also just asked, where do people purchase those green uh, street number, a uh, house number signs? Yeah, another really good question. So um, here in Frederick County, uh, and I, I, I apologize, I can't speak to exactly which ones they are, but there's a, a number of volunteer fire companies that are able to provide those signs uh, through an order form. Uh, again, also a quick Google search uh, will we'll, uh, connect folks to different manufacturers and they can get those custom printed. You can get horizontal, you can get vertical, green, blue, um, you know, there's a lot of options out there. So uh, local fire companies and, um, and, and the trusty Google site. Um, <laughs> and I think I, I've actually, I live out in the country and it's hard to see our uh, driveway. So I've looked into those and I'm pretty sure I've through the Frederick County uh, government website. If you go to fire and rescue, I think there's a link to find that, those order forms. Um, so that's great information. So there's been some chatter uh, in the chat box about uh, alert system. So if somebody has a call button alert system, um, is that the same as 911? How does that work with 911? So that goes to whoever they have their medical alert through and their alarm, basically like an alarm company, that company will then contact us provide us the information. Often the patient is still on the phone with that company 
and we'll have a three way call to be able to get the proper information to get to the uh, residents. Okay, so it definitely it doesn't um, hinder it actually is very helpful because someone who can't access a phone could push that button. But we all know that it only works if you're wearing it. If it's hanging on the bedpost and you're on the floor in the bathroom, it's not particularly helpful. It's not going to help. <laughs> you can tell I've heard that more than once. <laughs> yeah. um, I'd like to go back to the, you talked about the red folders and one of the things you uh, mentioned was the MOLST form and, and you made a distinction. A lot of people think, well, I have an advanced directive, but Matt, if someone chooses to be a do not resuscitate, a paramedic can't read through an advanced directive, right? The only thing they can honor in that moment of crisis is a MOLST form that's been signed by a doctor. Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. We, um, everything that, that paramedics and EMTs do in the field, you know, from administering oxygen to putting a, a splint on a wound, uh, everything that we do is, is technically considered a doctor's order. Uh, a lot of those are through standing protocols. Uh, so it, while it looks like we're doing things autonomously, uh, again, they are at the direction of a medical uh, director, a physician. So, so, uh, yeah. so some of the folks that were on our webinar last month, we had Michelle, actually Jackie Dinterman from Frederick Health uh, talked about most forms. So people can contact their doctor's office if they uh, are interested in talking with the physician about a most form or Frederick, uh, uh, Frederick Health. Uh, has a team of folks who can be involved. Matt, can people contact you? Or... They, they absolutely can. We're, we're happy to answer any questions they have and we can help navigate them to, uh, you know, either to their primary care physician or to uh, Jackie and, and Michelle and their team. Uh, you know, they have a, um, uh, a staff that's able to help complete that documentation. They have their, the practitioners on, on staff to be able to to do that, so maybe if somebody doesn't have a uh, have a primary care, maybe they're new to the area, uh, whatever the case may be, they uh, they can certainly reach out to to Michelle and, and Jackie, and and their staff can help with that as well. And we're happy to to facilitate that conversation. Excellent. And so Matt, here's another question, or Christy as well. So okay, no CPR is checked on the moles. What what happens in that nine one one call? Are people going to take do anything? Uh, yeah, um, you know, certainly the, the first thing we wanna do is verify uh, the accuracy, right? We're gonna make sure that um, the, the most form is, is correctly filled out. And, uh, and, and in the event that it's indicated that no CPR is requested, uh, you know, that's, that's what we're gonna honor. And, and then we kind of turn and focus our efforts on supporting the family. Um, but there's, uh, you know, some other components to that, uh, you know, that we would be able to do. And, and certainly, uh, as long as the patient is, is able to converse with us, uh, you, you know, they may have a, a most form that indicates no CPR. And, uh, you know, they can say, look, look, you know, I know what my most says, but I, I do want you to help me. Uh, and so we, uh, we will only kind of hold people to their most form if they're not able to tell us otherwise that they would want something done. The most form is, is a way for p, uh, patients to speak when they, when they aren't physically able to do so themselves. Excellent. Um, let's see what our other questions are. Here's a question. This has come up in our support group here uh, before. So you know, we always think about most of the folks on our call are caregivers. And so probably 99% of the time you're anticipating if you're calling 911, it's for the person you care for. But as if we've talked about in our support group, that isn't always the case. And what happens if it's the caregiver who's having a medical emergency and has to call 911? Uh, one of the things we've talked about in our group, maybe keeping in that red folder, is some content information about the person, let's say with dementia and who to call maybe that could come stay with them. What, what do you do in that situation when there's clearly someone who's impaired, but they're not the one who's on the floor? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So uh, our providers are um, you know, trained to kind of be in tune to that and 
to, to be aware that sometimes the, the person that we're there to help is the caregiver and that by um, transporting that person to the hospital, we're, we're creating a situation where there now, now may be somebody uh, who's at risk. And, um, you know, one of the things that we may consider is, you know, is the safest option at that point in time to actually transport both the, the caregiver and the recipient. The recipient may not have a, a medical need or a medical emergency, but if, um, if the safest option at that point in time is to bring the recipient with the caregiver until we can put some form of uh, structured support in place, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly able to and, and happy to, to do that. That's uh, really good to know. The, the community health program is also able to assist and, and our providers have reached out uh, in the past to uh, share, you know, when, when they encounter those scenarios. And in the past, law enforcement has also assisted in these type of incidents, whereas um, if, there, if EMS had to transport to the hospital pretty rapidly, we would send the uh, law enforcement out to stand by until a family member could come by or um, get additional help to that residence. That's really good to know. I, I hope that everybody takes a little bit of comfort, but still important to be prepared. Have a plan in your head if something happened to you, who could come and step in and take care of your loved one? And would they know where their medications are and uh, other things like that? If someone doesn't know, let's say it's an automobile accident or you fall walking in the park, um, does cell phone GPS, is that ever play a part? Yes, it does. So um, if you have your location services turned on on your cell phone, we are able to do a phase two to be able to locate you. We're getting more technology, better technology where we can locate um, those on cell phones a little bit easier and faster. Um, especially if they don't know exactly where they are. So yes, it does help to have the location services on. And also we do have text to 911 now as well. Uh, and Frederick County was the pilot program in 2014 because we had the Maryland School for the Deaf. So we were the pilot program in the state of Maryland and um, it has grown tremendously. Um, but if a person can make a voice call, we prefer that so we can hear the noises in the background to be able to one, determine where people are. Um, if they're at a, let's just say Harry Grove Stadium watching a Keys game and they're not exactly sure, they're out on the street and they're not exactly sure, they're not from the area. Um, if we hear the announcer <laughs> or people cheering, the little things actually help us a lot of times. So that's not just on TV. You guys, Correct. you really do that. <laughs> yes. That's great. Um, back to the moles form. So I think on the moles, there's a section about transportation to hospital. So I have two questions for you. What if the moles form says no transport to the hospital? And what if the patient refuses transportation to the hospital? Yeah, uh, those are good questions. And, and they, um, you know, they can be a little bit of a, a challenging situation for providers and, and patients and families. Um, you know, each, each situation we're going to look at kind of in a, in a case by case basis, because we recognize that no two emergencies are ever going to be truly alike. Uh, so providers will use some clinical judgment uh, and, and do what you know, is both safest and also in, in the best interest of the patient and their family. Um, all of our uh, clinicians carry a radio and on that radio, they're able to, to converse with a physician at the hospital uh, for further direction and guidance. And so when we encounter situations that, that kind of fall outside of the, the textbook per se, uh, we're able to lean on our physician counterparts to help kind of navigate us through making, um, you know, safe decisions that, that really do take the patient's best interest in mind. It um, really sounds like I certainly didn't appreciate how much of a team effort it is behind the scenes at 911. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of work together to get people the right help, as you say, the right help to the right place uh, in, in the right amount of time. So we have, um, we have staff, but a call taker, if they're taking your call, they're not the ones dispatching the call. 
So normally while we're taking the call and asking the questions, people think that we're going to be dispatching that call or we're going to be responding to that call. We want, the, we want the caller to be comfortable and reassured that we are getting help to them. But we're asking those questions while another dispatcher is dispatching the units or the resources to that call. That's good to know. Having called 911, you do feel a little frustrated that there's so many questions and you're panicking that I need help now. So that's good to know that help is on the way. You're just yes. fleshing out the rest of the information. Yes. How about, what do you do with the frequent callers, right? When you've got someone at maybe home alone or home with a caregiver and they're having to call 911 a lot, what, what can caregivers do? That's a, that's a good question. And, and that's certainly something that we've identified uh, here in Fire Rescue. It's actually the, uh, the catalyst for our community health program was born out of that very question. Uh, as kind of silly as it sounds, uh, if I do a very good job at, at what I'm supposed to be doing, I, I could potentially put us out of business. Uh, we, we did a really good job several decades ago with fire prevention. We started launching a lot of uh, fire prevention based activities. We got into schools, we got into homes, we got an entire week in October to focus on fire prevention. And as a result, uh, you know, we were pretty impactful with that. The, the amount of, of fire-based responses has declined uh, significantly to, to the point so that, um, and, and Christy can tell you this, 80% uh, of the folks that call into the 911 center don't need a fire truck, they need an ambulance um, or, or some form of, of EMS uh, assistance. And so uh, our community health program was established to, to do the same thing that we did with fire prevention a couple of decades ago. Uh, we wanna be able to, to identify folks who are at a little bit higher risk of, of injuries or illness and try to connect those folks with resources available here in Frederick County to, to keep them safe and keep them healthy. And so uh, through this initiative, we've been able to identify uh, you know, some of our folks that do uh, fall into that high risk category and do have, um, you know, a couple more calls to 911 than, than they would probably like to have to make. And, and we're able to go out and work closely, even through the pandemic, we, we were able to go out into the home. Uh, and that was a service that wasn't available through all of our, our community health counterparts, the, the health department, uh, senior services division, and, uh, and adult services through the state. Uh, they weren't able to get into the home uh, where we, we were able to kind of help out with that. And, and uh, so we work very closely with our local partners to make sure that, that the resources that are available uh, are not unknown. We, want, we don't like when, when those resources are a secret. And so we work very closely with all of our partners and our folks in the community to make sure everybody's connected in a way that's gonna be most beneficial for them. That is good to know. Um, I've got a question here about a grab bar program for homes. Yeah, uh, this is a, a very exciting new initiative that um, we're, we're in the process of launching right now with the advocates for the aging in Frederick County, where, uh, you know, one of the, the most uh, dangerous things that a, a singer can experience is a fall. And, and falls are scary for a couple of reasons. Um, low, what we consider to be low mechanism falls or ground level, um, you know, falls that aren't necessarily from height. Uh, as we age, they, they can become more dangerous. They can have longer lasting implications. Um, and, and one of the things that's, you know, very frustrating about falls is that a lot of times they can be prevented with the right tools and the right hardware. And, and our partners with the Advocates for the Aging uh, you know, they really championed that. And, and when we express to them what we encounter uh, all too frequently, at the, this, I believe, at least in, in 2019, uh, of all of the EMS responses that our fire rescue units handled, uh, the second highest number of responses was for somebody that fell. And so uh, they were able to help secure some grant funding to install uh, in, in certain situations, install grab bars in, in the houses of folks who are, are, again, considered to be at higher risk for falling. 
And, uh, and we're still in the process of, of finalizing that, uh, that partnership, but our, our EMS clinicians that are out there every day, uh, they're starting to pay attention to, to see who those folks are that, that may truly benefit from having those grab bars installed. And, and we're looking to bring that uh, program fully online here very soon. That's very exciting. That is, um, there's such a great collaboration here in Frederick County. We're such a, a, a small network and it's really exciting. We've talked about this before, all the interplay be between different agencies and, and departments and divisions. Um, it's, it's exciting to see that. Um, I wanna ask about the non-emergency line. You mentioned that before, and when is it appropriate to call that? And when is it not? So it, you can call that number anytime. It all, all the calls come into the center, but always remember emergency calls, the 911 number is to be called for all emergencies. Um, the non-emergency line 301-600-1603 is for something that's happened in the past. Um, let's just say more so for like police, if your uh, mailbox, if you had a mailbox destruction, um, you could call that number and contact us that way instead of uh, tying up a 911 call. Um, we wanna keep our operators available for the 911 calls but we will always take care of the non-emergency lines as well. Um, you could call at the non-emergency number also if you wanna provide us the information, information such as the lockbox uh, key code, that's a good time to call that number as well. So those type of things are um, just two examples uh, to call the non-emergency line. Uh, we also have, um, we um, also take the burn bans uh, or burn permits uh, when there is not a burn ban in effect, the burn ban's in effect right now, but those are type of things that uh, we get those calls for. We call that number often <laughs> at my house. Um, how about though, what if someone has had a fall, not bleeding, not injured, but the caregiver simply can't lift them? What, what happens there? Who do they call? Can they call? Is there someone to call? Sure. So you could call 911 for that, but since it, uh, they're not injured, uh, just basically need uh, lift assist, I would assume, uh, you could call us. We'll use a protocol to follow just to make sure that patient or person or citizen is not injured. Uh, we want to make sure we get the right resources to them, but you can call that number and we would use a protocol even if it's on a non-emergency line. Excellent. Folks, we've got a few more minutes. If you have any questions, I encourage you to um, put them into the chat or the Q&A. Um, great information tonight from both of you and great questions. Um, hopefully everybody in the audience has learned something new. I hope you never ever have to call 911, but um, if you do, I hope this uh, sets you up with a, a little bit of confidence. Um, let me just check one more place. Uh, oh, is there a phone number to contact Matt for the grab bar program? Yeah, uh, they can contact our program directly and we can, uh, again, facilitate the, uh, the conversation with the advocates, uh, for the aging. Uh, and that's going to be the same phone number too, for the red folders. If, if for some reason they're not able to get out, uh, Christina to, um, either uh, to Daybreak or, or to another location. Uh, and the phone number for our program is 301-600-0624. Excellent. So again, if you uh, want a red folder, I, I offer simply because we're in a brick and mortar location, I have red folders. Um, we're not letting people into daybreak, but certainly I can run a, a red folder out into the parking lot. If you want one, just give us a call. Um, certainly if you have questions, uh, need one delivered to you or have questions about the moles form, you can call Matt again at that number. And then again, that was 301-600-0624, correct? Yep. Perfect. Uh, let me just check the chat box one more time. I guess that was uh, that was it. Uh, Christy and Matt, I thank you. Um, all of you in the audience, I thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, let me make my screen a little bigger. 
Um, I want to let you know that next month we our uh, webinar will be on July 8th, Thursday, the second Thursday of the month, always on July 8th. We are changing our time. Thank you to those of you who answered our survey questions. We're trying to make this as easy for you as possible. Quite a few of you uh, wrote that a, a time change a little bit later would be better for you. So we're going to try 7 to 8 p.m. That'll be on July 8th. And we thought we'd get a little bit lighter. We've had some heavy topics the last few months. So we are going to be talking about summer fun in Frederick. I'm uh, very excited to have someone from Visit Frederick uh, be our presenter. Really going to focus on accessible uh, locations, things to do in Frederick County that you could do with the person you care for, uh, whether they have a mobility impairment, a memory impairment, uh, just don't move that easily. There's a lot of stuff to do here in the county uh, that, uh, that you can do with them or with other members of your family. So maybe give you some new energy, some new ideas uh, to get out of the house now that we can all finally start getting out of the house, uh, some fun things to do. So mark your calendars for July 8th. That registration will be available uh, as soon as we finish up here tonight, and I'll, I'll send that information out to you again as well. Um, thank you again to our sponsor, Right at Home In-Home Care uh, and Assistance. Very happy to have their ongoing support. And uh, with that, I'm just going to check. We've got some more. Ah, we've got a lot of thank yous. So truly, thank you, Christy and Matt, for your time tonight. Thank you again for all of you for joining us. And we will see you next month. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.